One of the main reasons that we see so little godliness and seriousness in contemporary Christianity is due to the fact that there is such a shallow understanding of what it means to be a Christian. You can hear people talk about being Christian in terms that almost contradict the Bible at various points today and become highly offended if you question their meaning or their understanding. When God makes a person a Christian, He gives that person a new nature. He gives him a new life so that the way things were before he or she became a Christian is different than the way things are now. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Paul says, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Well, to rightly understand what it means to be a Christian is to have some biblical awareness of what constitutes those old things and what is involved in those new things that come. And at the heart of much spiritual confusion in our day is a misunderstanding of Paul's meaning exactly at that point. Well, the Apostle Paul goes to great lengths in his letter to the church at Rome in order to clear up such confusion. He is concerned in that letter to help us understand what true Christianity is, what a true Christian is, by helping us understand what the true gospel is. We've been studying this book now for some time, and you'll recall in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, he lays out for us the whole theme of the letter. He has some introductory greetings to the church and expresses to them how he wants to see them and looks forward to that opportunity. But then in in verse 16 and 17, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. The gospel is going to be the theme and the power of the gospel to save and what happens when that powerful gospel does save. He says he's not ashamed of it because it is the power of God to save all who believe, Jews first and then also those who are not Jews, who are Gentiles. And he gives us the reason that the gospel is powerful. It's because in the gospel is found that righteousness that God requires of us. All of us, everybody you know, has been made by God, for God, in the image of God, And as such, God says, and here is what I require of the creatures who bear my image. But because of sin, none of us can deliver what God requires. Sin keeps us from being righteous. But God himself provides the righteousness that he requires. And he does it in and through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus came into the world and earned righteousness. And as one who lived a completely righteous life, always obeying God's commandments, he had no reason to fear the wrath of God against sin because he never sinned. But nevertheless, he voluntarily laid down his life on the cross under the wrath of God in behalf of sinners like you and me so that anyone and everyone who trusts him might justly escape God's wrath by being able to claim that Jesus Christ has died for me. And in Christ, being united to Christ through faith, we find peace with God. We find reconciliation with God. The salvation that God provides to sinners through Jesus comes to us by grace alone. You can't earn it. Nothing you can do To win God's favor for yourself. God saves out of sheer sovereign grace. And we receive it through faith alone. Not through faith plus being good. Not through faith plus making promises. But by simply renouncing how we've been living. Quit trusting in that. And beginning to trust in Christ. It's faith alone. And that faith must be not in the church and not in 
your understanding of what spirituality is or not in some ideas that maybe have come into your head through the course of your life, that faith must be in Jesus Christ, the real Christ, the one the Bible reveals to us. His life of obedience, his sacrificial death, as we have sung this morning, his blood, his blood, (laughs) believing that what God says about the death of Jesus is true, that it has satisfied the just demands of God's law against sinners. And as we, by grace alone, through faith alone, trust in Christ alone, we're reconciled to God. That's salvation. That's what a Christian is. Well, Paul addresses this understanding of biblical Christianity and what the gospel is and how a person becomes a Christian by believing the gospel in his letter to the church at Rome. And in the process, he disabuses us and other readers of wrong ideas about Christianity. Because here's the way some people think. Well, man, if this is all grace, I mean, I don't have to be good in order for God to accept me, then I kind of like that. I can just kind of claim this grace and go ahead and keep living in sin. Well, if that's the way you're thinking, and if you've been tempted to think that way, you're not alone, first of all, because there are many people throughout history who have thought like that. But you need to understand that way of thinking is completely contrary to what the Bible says happens when God actually changes a person and makes that person a Christian. You cannot be genuinely saved by God's grace through faith in Christ and go on living in sin. You can't do it. You'll never be satisfied to do it. No true Christian makes peace with his sin and says, hey, I have grace so I can live however I want to live. Paul addresses this question in Romans 5 and 6, where we have been most recently in our studies. In chapter 5, verse 20, he makes this amazing statement that where sin increased, grace abounded. And of course, he anticipates the question, well, if that's true, then more sin, more grace. Well, don't we want more grace then? Shouldn't we do more sin, right? So he anticipates it in chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? And then he answers that in the most decisive language by no means in verse 2. He says a Christian cannot go on living in sin and he argues the reason why in verses 2 through 14. Because a Christian is united to Jesus Christ. Through faith we actually get joined to Christ and you can't be in right relationship with Christ and drag him through a life of sin. If you think that you can do that, you're not thinking biblically and you need to back up and say, okay, God, how did I get these wrong ideas of what it means to be a Christian? In verse 14 14 of chapter 6, he makes another astounding statement about this salvation we have. Look at this verse 6, chapter 6, verse 14. He says, for sin will have no dominion over you since you're not under law, but you're under grace. So wait a minute. Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And you're not under law, you're under grace. So sin won't have dominion on you, over you. Well, again, you, you can anticipate a question. Paul does anticipate it in verse 15. What then are we to sin because we're not under law, but under grace? If, if the law doesn't rule us anymore, can't we just kind of forget about the law and just do what feels right, what we think is good in our own understanding? Well, Paul spends the last half of chapter 6 showing that living under grace and not under law does not mean that you can go on pursuing a life of sin because to be under grace means that you have willingly, you have joyfully become a slave to Jesus Christ. Not only is a Christian united to Jesus, a Christian is someone who's devoted to Jesus. Before you became a Christian, you were a slave to sin. You you did what seemed natural, what your own appetites desired without any consideration for God's glory. But when you become a Christian, your slavehood is transferred from sin to Jesus. And you're a bondservant of His. Christians are not under the law, 
then what purpose does the law serve for a Christian? Well, Paul takes that question into consideration in Romans chapter 7. And that's where we are today. We are beginning to look at this incredible chapter, what commentators have said to be the most controversial chapter in all of the book of Romans, of the letter of Romans. In chapter 7 of Romans, the theme that Paul takes up is the law of God. He uses the word law or commandment 29 times in the 25 verses of this chapter. And what we find him doing is showing us how the law functions in the life of a believer as well as how the law functions in the lives of unbelievers. So this morning we want to look at the first section of Romans 7, which is verses 1 through 6. Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. It's found on page 943 of the Bibles in front of you. And I encourage you to get a copy of God's Word and open it up so that you can actually follow along. I'm going to read through this passage. And then we're just going to go verse by verse looking at what the Lord says to us in this portion of His Holy Word. So follow along as I read Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. Or do you not know, brothers, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives? For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she's free from that law. And if she marries another man, she's not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions, aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now that we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit, and not in the old way of the written code. Christ frees us from the law so that we might bear fruit for God. Paul wants Christians to understand our relationship to God's law. We're saved by grace, grace plus nothing. We're no longer under the bondage of sin, and we're no longer under the rule of law. Rather, we're under the rule of grace through faith in Jesus Christ. In this first section, Paul states a principle in verse 1. He then illustrates it in verses 2 and 3. He then takes that principle and applies it to Christians in verse 4. And then in verses 5 and 6, he explains why all of this is necessary. And so I just want to walk through this passage with you by showing you those four points that we find in these six verses. First, look at the principle in verse 1. Here it is. The law's reign over a person is broken by death. Now, Paul in verse 1 is highlighting the obvious, and he knows it's obvious, the language that he uses. Do you not know, brothers? In other words, duh, of course you know this. I'm just going to remind you of what already ought to be in your mind. And then he gives that little parenthetical clarification too. For I'm speaking to those who know the law. Who's he talking about? Well, he's talking about the original recipients in the church at Rome. Certainly the Jewish Christians in the Roman church would have known the law. They would have been schooled in the law to have been a faithful Jew or even a, a somewhat uh, casual Jewish participant in the synagogues and temple worship of the first century would have meant you would have been acquainted with the Old Testament law. But it wasn't just Jews that Paul was concerned with here or that he's talking about when he says, you certainly know the law. He's also thinking about the Gentile Christians in the church at Rome because they too would have been instructed from the Old Testament because the Old Testament was the only written Bible they had in the first century. And many of those first Gentile converts came from among the groups of Gentiles known as God-fearers. You can read about that in Acts chapter 10 with this centurion named Cornelius that the Lord sent Peter to him in his household and he was described as a God-fearing 
Gentile. So familiar with the synagogue, having gone to synagogue, having listened to the instruction of the rabbis, being familiar with the Old Testament written codes. The principle that Paul lays out to those who should have some background in what he's about to say is this. The law rules over people only as long as they live under it. You're only ruled by the law as long as you live under that law. Now, what law is Paul referring to? I believe he's referring to the Mosaic law, to the law that God spoke from Mount Sinai. Now, this is how he frequently frequently refers to the Old Testament law. We've seen it already in our walk through these first six chapters of Romans. In chapter 3, verse 19, if you look at that, he, he uses this language, for we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. And then Romans five thirteen, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin was not counted where there is no law. The law obligates those who are under it. If you had been a Jew in Old Testament times, you would have been obligated to keep every aspect of Old Testament law, the dietary laws, the clothing laws, the ceremonial laws, the seasonal laws, all of that would have belonged to you. Well, if you were a Gentile born in Old Testament era or in the first century, you wouldn't necessarily have been required to keep the Old Testament ceremonies and the Old Testament civil code, but you would have certainly been required to keep the moral law, which all of God's image bearers are always required to keep. And this is why Paul says what he does at the end of chapter 3, or Romans chapter 3, verse 19, that the whole world might be held accountable to God. Everyone who is an image bearer of God, living in God's world, comes into the world obligated to God's law. We're not Jews, bound to all the Old Testament niggling details, but we are people who are obligated to live before the God who has defined righteousness for us in the Ten Commandments. Paul elaborates the predicament that all people find themselves in when he writes to the churches of Galatia. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 10, he says, For all who rely on works of law, bound by the law, living under the law, thinking you can make yourself right with God by doing what the law says, everybody like that, he says, is under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to do them. So here we are, we've been born in this world, we live here in the 21st century, every one of us came into the world under the law of God. We have obligations to that law, to live up to that law. And no one of us, and nobody you know, is capable of fulfilling those obligations. We're not able to meet the law's demands. But Paul wants to make the point here in verse 1 that the relationship, this being bound to the law, only exists as long as a person is alive. Only as long, he says, as he lives. It's kind of like living under the U.S. tax code if you're a citizen of the United States. You know, they say there's only two things certain in life. It's death and taxes, right? And when you die, you don't have to pay taxes anymore, except the government has figured out a way for a death tax if you have enough possessions. So your things that you leave behind are taxed. But you don't have to worry about taxes or any other civil codes when you die. That law is no longer reigning over you. Well, that's Paul's point. The law reigns over a person who's bound to it, and it is only broken by death. Well, after stating the principle in verse 1, in verses 2 and 3, he illustrates it. And he uses the illustration of marriage. A married woman is obligated by the law of marriage to remain faithful to her husband. Now, that's the frame of reference that Paul's operating out of in this illustration. He's referring to the seventh commandment. She's bound to her husband to live with her husband as his wife. And she's bound to do this 
as long as he lives, while he lives, verse 2 says. It's a continuing obligation that only can be separated by death. So again, look at the end of verse 2. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law of marriage. Obligated to the law only as long as there's no death. So the requirements of marriage law are broken by death. If there is no death, and the woman is married to her husband, and she decides that she wants to take up with another man and go live with him as her husband, then Paul says, rightly, she is an adulterer. But if her husband dies, then she may go and lawfully take up with another man and live with him as her husband by becoming that man's wife. The the point Paul's making is this, that marriage law binds the marriage partners until death separates them. If a wife decides to go marry someone else, then she breaks the law of marriage and she's under condemnation. But if her husband dies... She can go marry someone else and not be violating the marriage law. Why? Because if her husband dies, she's no longer a wife. She no longer has obligations to the marriage covenant. And she can go and be lawfully married to another. Now, some people get confused by Paul's illustration in verses 2 and 3. And it seems to me that the root of the confusion, and I've read several different ways that this has been distorted in in some experience, some attempts to explain what Paul means. But at the root of all of it is they take an illustration and they try to turn it into an allegory. They try to turn it into a parable where everything has exact, exact precise meaning to something else. And so they say here, well, you know, the, uh, the man, the husband represents the law and the wife represents the Christian. Well, if you take it that way, you carry it on down, you're going to be hopelessly confused because of what Paul later teaches. Paul is not using an allegory here. He is simply making a point. Don't overinterpret his point here. His emphasis is on death breaking the obligations that a spouse has to the law of marriage. It's, it's really simple. If you'll understand verses 2, illustrating verse 1, you'll see that Paul is saying that the law you are under only obligates you as long as you are alive under it. That's the point. That's what he's illustrating. Well, having given us the point, verse 1, illustrated it in verses 2 and 3, Paul then applies this principle to Christians in verse 4. Look at verse 4. Likewise, in the same way, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ. There's been a death that has occurred every time a person becomes a Christian. So that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. Christians have been set free from the law through Christ. The law by its nature makes demands of us. It places requirements on us both positively and negatively. Positively, God's law that binds every creature made in his image when we come into the world requires that we earn perfect righteousness to be accepted by God. We must live in complete obedience to his commandments, to his moral code. Everybody you know, Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, it doesn't matter. Everyone who's made in God's image comes into the world ruled by God's law that says you must be completely righteous. That's the positive requirement. But God's law also has a negative requirement. It requires that unrighteousness that we commit be paid for. Unrighteousness, sin, must be paid for. How? What's the payment? Eternal death. Condemnation forever. Wrath of God. These requirements are ours by nature. Every person you know by nature is obligated, bound to God's law in this way. But for Christians, these requirements, these moral obligations that press down upon us and demand that they be met or else we must be punished has been removed by a death. A death has occurred. 
to break our relationship with God's law. There are two deaths in Paul's mind when he says, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ. There's the death of believers. You also have died. He's speaking of Christians having experienced a death. And he he puts it passively. So it's something that's happened to us. It's not something that we ourselves have done. But it is definitive. It happened at a point in time. You have died. But Paul also has in mind the death of Christ. Because he says, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ. The body of Christ is a clear Reference to the crucifixion of Jesus, where on the cross his body was broken for us. So what Paul is saying is the believer's death occurs through the death of Christ. What happens to a Christian definitively at a point in time that is done to him is through what happened to Jesus 2,000 years ago when he voluntarily gave up his body to death on the cross. Jesus has set those who trust in him free from the law. His death on the cross becomes our own death when we trust him as Lord. Now, Paul has just spent a whole chapter, chapter 6 of Romans, underscoring this very point, that through our faith in Jesus, we have been united to him. We are in him. So what he experienced becomes our experience by faith. Just look at chapter 6 again. Just let your eyes kind of skim down these verses. Look at verse 2. He says, how can we who died to sin live in it? Verse 3, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? You, You see the connection? Our death, Christ's death, We have been united with him in a death like his. We've experienced a death through faith in Christ. Death to our old life because Christ died on the cross. Verse 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him. Look at verse 8. Now, if we have died with Christ. Brothers and sisters, our union with Christ through faith means that we have been joined to him. We have been united to him in death. We have experienced in Christ death to sin. So sin no longer rules and reigns in a Christian's life. That's what Paul emphasizes in chapter 6. But here in chapter 7, he says that our death in Christ, with Christ, means we have died to the law. That's his emphasis that he wants us to understand. His point is that the law no longer is the Christian's slave master demanding more than we can pay. We're no longer under the law in the sense that we no longer have to try to meet its demands in order to gain acceptance with God. We no longer have to fear our inability to live perfectly, righteously, in our own efforts, will incur God's wrath. Why? Because we died to the law through our union with Christ. His death and our death through him, which we participate in by faith, frees us from both the positive demands of the law as well as the negative demands of the law. The law no longer reigns over us as Lord. Rather, now the law guides us as our servant. We're going to see this later in chapter 7. Well, after stating that we are dead to the law in the first part of verse 5, Paul goes on to add, In the second part, Christians now belong to the risen Christ. It's interesting the language that he uses here. It's very careful. So that you may belong to another, not the law, but to him who has been raised from the dead. We have a new master. A new master. And it's not a written code. It's a living Lord. It's the one who gave his life for us. And Paul specifically underscores who has been raised from the dead. He has conquered sin and death. He has resurrection power. And in him, we access that power. By turning from sin and trusting Christ, a person is under the rule and reign of, is no longer under the rule and reign of God's law. 
which means we're no longer under the rule and reign of sin. Because the law has no power to deliver anyone from sin or to make any sinner righteous. When you confess your sin to God and you receive the Lord Jesus Christ through faith, you become united to Jesus. And his death under the curse of the law becomes your death to the law. So the law that once condemned you no longer terrorizes you. The law which once you flaunted with no regard no longer can condemn you. Furthermore, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead assures us that we also will be raised with him because we belong to him. We have new life. We're under new management. Well, all of this, our death to the law and being united to the risen Christ is for the purpose of bringing glory to God in the way that we live. Or as Paul puts it at the end of verse four, so that in order that we may bear fruit for God, Christians are able to live fruitful lives for God. In other words, we are to be holy. We are to have lives that are productive Lives that exude the fruit of the Spirit. Christians are able to see love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control growing in our lives. Why? Because we are joined to the risen Christ. We belong to Him. Paul is simply reiterating what he's already written in chapter 6 of Romans in verses 20 through 22. Look at those verses just above where our text is. He says in verse 20 of Romans 6, For when you were slaves of sin, under the law, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now shamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin, died to the law, and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification, and its end is eternal life. The law cannot make a sinful person right with God, nor can it make sinful people bear righteous fruit. No matter how loudly you proclaim it, no matter how clearly you set it forth, the only way that a person can start living the way that God calls us to live is for that person to die to the law, to die to sin. How? By confessing your sin. By just admitting what you know to be true of yourself, that you can't keep God's commandments, that all of your efforts in trying to measure up to God's commandments will only result in your condemnation because you can't make yourself good enough for God. Do you feel that? Have you ever acknowledged that in your own life? You might be here this morning and and maybe you're a stranger to Christ, to forgiveness, but you know and and it resonates with you Say, yeah, that's true. I know. I hear. I hear all the time what God requires. And I I can't do it. I just can't do it. And you might feel defeated. You might think, I I don't know. These guys must be just putting on a show. They must have just duped themselves into thinking they can be Christians because I just hear this is what God requires. And I know I can't require it. Listen, you don't become a Christian by somehow tricking yourself into believing that you've measured up. You become a Christian by dying. Dying to all those efforts to try to measure up to God's commandments. Dying to the law as your judge, your ruler, your master. And living through faith in Christ for another. Being united to Christ so that your life, your orientation is to Jesus Christ. And you trust him. You depend on him. You are confident in him. Through Jesus Christ, we can bear fruit for God. Because as we live for Christ, we desire to obey him. We want to keep God's commandments in Christ. We live for him. We obey him, not so that he will accept us, but because he has accepted us. Uh, if, If you're not trusting Christ this morning, I hope that you will see this. I pray that you'll see this, that you will not leave here without grasping this. The only way you can be right with your creator is through faith in Jesus Christ. You, you can't 
measure up. You just can't. We preach God's law here because God has given us that law. But that law was never designed to make sinners righteous in God's sight. It can't do it. Not because there's a problem with the law, but because there's a problem with us. Sin has perverted us. It's turned us against God into ourselves. And it's left us without the ability to do what God requires. And so God in grace, God in mercy, sent His Son into the world to fulfill all of the law's just demands, including the demand that the soul that sins must surely die. And so He went to that cross and He took His sins the sins of his people upon himself. And God poured out his wrath on his son on the cross. And that's what Jesus was doing on the cross. He was providing atonement, providing salvation for people like you and me. And the only hope, the only way that you can be right with your creator is to turn from your sin, confess it right now and trust Jesus. Friend, listen, right now, where you are, you don't have to go through a ritual. You don't have to jump through a hoop. Just where you are, admit what the Bible says is true. What you know in your heart of hearts, in those moments when nobody else is around, late at night maybe, before you go to bed and you're thinking, you know, I, I know, I know I can't do what God requires. Well, confess that to God. Acknowledge that. And take God at his word when he says, that's why I sent my son. And trust the Lord Jesus. Trust Him right now. You'll be saved. You'll be reconciled to your Creator. You will die to the law as your master. And you will be united to another master. The Lord Jesus. Who loves you. Who shed His blood for you. Who is good and wise and almighty. And He will guide you. Trust Him. Trust Him. Can't you just take God at His word? Believe that there's grace and mercy for you. Brothers and sisters, we need to see this. Don't get confused about the role that God's law plays in the life of a Christian. We do not obey his commandments so that God will accept us, so that he will love us. He already loves us. He's already accepted us for Christ's sake. The law is not our master. Christ is. We're not under the law. We're under grace. We died to the law as a mechanism for making us right with God. And now we're united to Christ. And through faith in him, we can please God by living a life of holiness. And God accepts our obedience, not because it's perfect, but because it's offered in faith. It's offered in Christ. Well, the law's reign over a person is bound a person who is bound to it is broken only by death. And after stating the principle in verse 1, illustrating it in verses 2 and 3, applying it to Christians in verse 4, Paul goes on in verses 5 and 6 to explain it. These two verses are contrasting against each other. Verse 5 explains how the law operated us in the past before we became Christians. Verse 6 explains how the law, how being released from the law as our master that demanded that we earn righteousness before it, we are now free to serve in the power of the Spirit. I want you to to really pay attention to verses 5 and 6. We're just going to kind of do a summary of them this morning. But they set the agenda for the rest of Romans 7. And if you don't see that, you don't see the connection with what follows verse 6 to verse 5, and then what continues to verse 6, then you'll probably not get Romans 7 straight, which many people today... Uh, do tend to confuse. Why we needed to die to the law. Verse 5 explains why. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. Before we came to faith in Christ, we were living in the flesh, that is, in our own strength, in, in sin. This is the way everybody comes into the world, how we live by nature. We were under that law that could not make us right with God. But what did the law do? It aroused our sinful passions. It led only to bearing fruit for death. Now we know this intuitively. The law simply cannot produce righteousness. I mean, it's still in us, even Christians, right? You walk by a a wall that has a big sign that says, wet paint, do not touch. 
you know, what is it just really, you know, you just, I mean, there's just something in us. The law does that. It stirs up passions. The law can't keep you from sinning. The law can't make you righteous, but boy, it can sure expose unrighteousness. So even when you attempt to obey the law outside of Christ, you're not keeping the law the way it's designed to be kept because whatever's not of faith is sin. And it's only what we do through faith in God who's given us His Son, the Lord Jesus, that is acceptable to Him as obedience. So our only hope is to turn from trying to make ourselves good enough from God, for God and to trust the Lord Jesus and in faith in Jesus live according to what He's revealed to be right and good and true. Verse 6 tells us the result of being freed from the law. But now, before, but now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Christians are no longer under the law as our master. It held us captive, but it no longer does. It had us boxed up so that there was no hope of escape. Faith in Christ sets us free from the law because the old person died and the new person comes to know God through that faith. And now we live in the power of the Spirit. We're free to serve in the Spirit. The Spirit who indwells us. So, for An unbeliever, the law of God is burdensome. It's always saying, do this, do this, do this, or else you're going to die. It's harsh, demanding what can never be delivered. But when you trust Jesus, you die to that relationship with the law. The law is still there. It's the same law. But it's the law that your master has fulfilled for you. And so it no longer is harsh. It's no longer burdensome. It's no longer something that you fear and dread. You can say now, I delight in the law of God, which Paul does later in this chapter. You are free now, not to go on living in sin, but to live a life of obedience in the power of God's spirit, not to fulfill some written code externally, but to bear fruit for God. This is Paul's argument in this opening section of Romans 7. Christ frees believers from the law so that we might bear fruit for God. Brothers and sisters, mark it down. Never let yourself get confused on this. God's law was not designed to make sinners right with God. It cannot do that. It was never intended to do that. Not because there's a problem with the law. But because there's a problem with us, we are sinful. We can't measure up to it. We can never be good enough for God in our own strength. But that's exactly what Jesus has done for us. And so we have his righteousness. We have his atoning death for our sins. And we are free to love God, to obey God, to bear fruit for God in the power of his spirit who resides within us. We must remember that the law's demands against us have been completely satisfied. We're free from that taskmaster. We now serve another. We can pursue lives of obedience to the commandments, not in our own strength, but in the strength of the risen Christ whose spirit lives in us. And God accepts our works now. He accepts our obedience. Why? Not because our obedience is suddenly spotless. No. No. At the end of every day, we have to say we're only unworthy servants we've done our duty but he accepts our obedience because that obedience is offered up to him not trying to earn righteous righteousness but that obedience is offered up to him in the one who did earn righteousness it's in christ it's through faith and god accepts our acts of obedience for christ's sake the 19th century hymn writer philip bliss captures this understanding of Paul's meaning in Romans 7, 1 through 6 with this old hymn. Free from the law, O happy condition, Jesus hath bled, and there's remission. Cursed by the fall, cursed by the law, bruised by the fall, grace has redeemed us once for all. Now we are free, there's no condemnation. Jesus provides a perfect salvation. Come unto me, O hear his sweet call. Come and he saves us, Once for all, once for all, O sinner, receive it. 
Once for all, O friend, now believe it. Cling to the cross. The burden will fall. Christ hath redeemed us once for all. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for giving us your word. We thank you for your law. It once condemned us. It terrorized us. It was a ruthless taskmaster. We thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, has fulfilled every last one of its demands for us. So help us to love him. Help us to bear fruit for you in the power of your spirit. I ask that you'd open the eyes of those here this morning who are strangers to your grace. Call them. Cause them to hear your voice through the word and the spirit that they might see and believe the gospel of the Lord Jesus. For we pray in his name. Amen.